Um, so this afternoon we're going to dig into some of the nitty-gritty, some of the legal questions, which I know a lot of you are really excited um, to get into. Um, I want to remind you again that our last session is going to be the session that we're really going to look to you to get some questions, remaining questions and some issues that you'd like to see us look at moving forward. So please start to think about that um, as we're going through the afternoon because we will be asking you for that. Um, so Brian Goldman is going to be taking over as uh, our little MC for the afternoon um, and will take us through the afternoon panels. So I have the honor of introducing Brian. Um, he is a partner at Goldman Law Offices located in Providence. <coughs> He's the chief legal counsel to the Rhode Island CR, CRMC. Um, he is a graduate of Middlebury College and Boston University School of Law. He is also a retired lieutenant colonel in the United States Air Force and Rhode Island Air National Guard, where he was a C-130 pilot and judge advocate. He's a veteran of both Desert Shield and Desert Storm. He is a long-term member of the Rhode Island Bar Association's Energy and Environmental Law Committee. During his tenure at CRMC Legal Counsel, he's repre represented CRMC in the United States Supreme Court of Palazzola versus the state of Rhode Island, uh, which is a significant case in the law of takings and inverse condemnations, and I suspect a case that many of you, if not all of you, are familiar with. <laughs> so um, please welcome Brian. Thank you and good afternoon. Um, since we did mention Palazzolo, I do have to note that my co-counsel from Palazzolo, Mike Rubin, is here. We did that case for 10 years. <laughs> Took quite some time, successfully, I would add. Um, this afternoon, we're going to um, discuss some potential liabilities that governments may have for failure to respond to climate change, um, some legal theories that, you may ha that, that, that are out there that uh, governments may have, municipalities and state agencies may have a result of failure to respond to climate change. And also um, some legal liabilities that governments and municipalities may have for a, a using climate change reasons to deny permits as well. I think that's a, a, another aspect of this that we have to talk about. And you know, why are we discussing this? And, and well, I just, before I get there, I just want to say this is meant to be, as, as, as I think Dennis said earlier, this is just to, meant to start starting the discussion on this issue. It's not dispositive. It, it's not exhaustive. It's just to get us all thinking about this because this is coming and we're going to have to deal with it. And I have a couple of visual examples of why I think we need to start talking about this. I, some pictures to start the afternoon with. Um, this is Green Hill Beach Club in 2006. This is Green Hill Beach Club after, two, after Hurricane Sandy. That structure had to be removed and moved inland. And picking on Green Hill Beach some more. This is um, Green Hill Beach, a house on Green Hill Beach in 2003. And I want you to take a note, right over here you can see that there's a walkway. This is that same place in 2005 after a storm, not a named storm, just a storm. You can see the erosion there. This is that structure after Hurricane Sandy. It's coming. Um, next slides, I thank you to C. Grant, and these are, I guess this is used called canvas projections. And uh, Grover Fugate, who spoke earlier, he uses these in some presentations that he's done, but this is Water Place Park at high, circa mean high water right about now. This is Water Place Park, three feet of sea level rise, which is around 2050. As you can see, it's <coughs> underwater. These are for Joe Nicholson. Uh, this is Parati Park in Newport, circa about now, with, at mean high water. <coughs> this is Parati Park with three feet of sea level rise. And finally, Joe, one more for you. I know you are enjoying me doing this. This is Ann Street Pier, uh, circa mean high water now. And Ann Street Pier, three feet of sea level rise. So, huh? I know, we're, we're, we're litigating the pier, I know. It's, we haven't got the extension yet. So that's why we're talking about this, because it's something that, as planners and litigators, solicitors, government lawyers, we need to be thinking about what happens if we allow people to do these things? Are we going to be liable for letting them do that? And we also need to be thinking about what happens if we use these sea level rise and, and climate change to say no, to not let people build what are we going to be facing as well? Our first speaker this afternoon 
uh, is Jenny Klein. Uh, Jenny Klein is a litigating associate, litigation associate at Kramer Levin and Nath Naftal Naftalis and Frankel. She graduated from Harvard Law School and earned a master's degree in public health from Harvard School of Public Health. Before joining Kramer Levin, she served as a law clerk for the Honorable Dora Isere and for the Honorable Judge Cheryl Pollack, both of the U.S. District Court for the Eastern District of New York. Most recently, she was the Associate Director and Legal Fellow for the Sabin Center for Climate Change Law, where she led a campaign to encourage consideration of climate impacts under various laws. Please welcome Jenny. Uh, these cases were withdrawn. They were not adjudicated on the merits. 
but we really wanted to think, you know, how might they have played out had they really been pursued. So the first big hurdle in bringing a negligence case against a city and or a state is sovereign immunity. <coughs> so states have sovereign immunity just by virtue of their sovereignty. Um, and that sovereignty, that immunity is codified by the 11th Amendment. So the default position is basically you can't sue a state for anything, right? But many states consent to be sued. And Rhode Island has a state tort claims act, the federal government has a federal tort claims act. Um, and the Rhode Island to uh, State Tort Claims Act is actually written in a very, in very broad language. I think you're going to hear more specific stuff about Rhode Island later, but I'm just going to touch upon some things related to the state. So it says, Rhode Island and any political subdivision thereof, including all cities and towns, shall be liable in all actions of tort in the same manner as a private individual or corporation. So basically the state's saying, you're just like anybody else for the purpose of the tort claim no sovereign immunity. But there are lots of carve-outs and exceptions. So there's monetary limitations, there's a statute of limitations, I think it's three years, um, and one significant one is the public duty doctrine. So that basically says, when the government's doing something that only governments do, then you still will have immunity. So, as I said, many states have carved out some exceptions to immunity. A really common one is the dangerous conditions exception. So for example, Pennsylvania says that local entities are liable for the care, custody, or control of real property in the possession of the local agency. Colorado similarly says sovereign immunity is waived for injuries resulting from a dangerous condition of any public property. And Michigan is a little more specific. It says government agencies are liable for injury resulting from dangerous conditions of a public building if the agency had knowledge of the defect and failed to remedy the condition or take reasonably necessary action to protect the public against the condition. So these are just examples, but I want to show that the dangerous conditions exception is really common. It's something that comes up a lot. In Rhode Island, you have the egregious conduct exception um, to the public duty doctrine. So essentially that says that the immunity defense will not fly where the public defendant has failed to remedy a peril caused by its own conduct and of which it has knowledge. So this case from 1991, Verity versus Dante, uh, a plaintiff had to walk off a sidewalk because there was a big tree in her way and she got hit by a car. And the court said that was egregious conduct and the city could not claim immunity. All right, so just to recap that, sovereign immunity is a real issue, but there's enough carve outs that people will be able to get past it if they frame their claim the right way. So going to, uh, the elements of the negligence claim. So remember, you need to say, you need to show that the defendant had a duty to act with reasonable care. You need to show that the defendant breached that duty. You need to show that the plaintiff suffered harm. And you need to show that the defendant's breach caused that harm. So let's take these one at a time and think about how climate change sort of changes the equation. So duty. So the dangerous condition waiver, in the same statute where they where states waive immunity, they also in some way are defining the scope of that liability, right? They're saying we have a duty to act in this certain way. And so you, that would be the first place to look. Um, but also ask, when are courts going to expand that duty or maybe further define it based on policy concerns, right? So they can't, they can't always find out exact from the statute exactly what the scope of the duty is, right? But they're going to look to things like, what was the foreseeability of this harm? What was the capacity of the government to prevent this harm versus the capacity of the individual to prevent the harm? Um, and what are the consequences to the community of imposing this duty on the city? So I would argue that climate change becomes relevant to this equation by thinking about the foreseeability. Right? We know that there's storms, but there's not always a hurricane Katrina. Right? That kind of thing is rare. But when you start to think about climate change, you start you can start to add to that equation, you know, how much more common are things like that gonna be? Or, or smaller storms, you know, just a hundred year storm becomes a 50 year storm, let's say. And I think that's something that, that courts may start to consider. So what about a duty? Okay, well, we know that it's harder to establish an affirmative duty to act, to act rather than to do nothing. It's harder to establish that than it is to establish that you have, have to exercise care when you are acting, right? And that's because it takes more discretion, right? You 
get to decide when you're going to act and when you're not. But when you do get to this, when you do act, you don't get discretion about having to do that in a reasonable manner. But I think that this um, distinction between acting and not acting is actually gets really blurry when you're talking about city infrastructure and things like that because you already have a sewer system. You already have these things in existence, and so to the extent that they are making flooding worse or creating a more dangerous condition, then you then you start to have a duty to do something to prevent that or to warn about it, right? So it doesn't really fall on that doing nothing, doing something reasonably fine as neatly. <coughs> and so here's an example um, from Florida, city of St. Petersburg versus Column. So three people drowned in an open storm drainage ditch. Um, <laughs> it's a really dangerous condition, right? The city was not liable for their decision to build that drainage system or how they did it, but once they did it and they created that dangerous condition, they were liable. They did have a duty to correct it. So they needed to either put a fence around it, put a sign up, or actually put a fence over that ditch that wasn't open anymore. <coughs> so breach. We know the city does not have to protect people from every possible harm, right? Just because someone gets hurt doesn't mean that there's been a breach. And this is going to be a really a line drawing question, right? It's going to be very fact specific to decide if the city or the state did enough. So here are some things that the court might consider. What information did you have? So this morning we're hearing about this great like block by block, address by address information. And this is a little bit of a double edged sword because you need this information, but now that the city have it, is there going to be more of a responsibility to do something with that information? That's debatable. Um, what resources did you have available? You know, how expensive would it be really to prevent a certain amount of harm? You're not going to be expected to do something that's 100 times your city budget, right? But you might be expected to do something that's cost effective. So we know about the hand formula from law school, right? This is <coughs> a formulation to figure out whether a duty has been breached that Judge Learned Hand wrote about. And it says, you have a breach if the likelihood of the harm times the magnitude of the harm is greater than the cost of preventing the harm. So in the climate change realm, an example might be to look at the chance of a 100-year storm in a given time period. You multiply that by how much damage would you expect to see in your city based on that, from that type of storm. Compare, compare that to the cost of the infrastructure changes you might have to make to prevent that flooding from happening. So where does climate change come into play? Well, that first part, chance of a 100-year storm, that's not the same in the future as it was in the past. The chance of a 100-year storm, by definition, is supposed to be 1%, right, for a year. But maybe now it's 1.5%, maybe it's 1.1%. Maybe that's the kind of thing, I think, that would change this formula a little bit. So that's Nashville. I think that's a really appropriate <laughs> photo for a flood in Nashville. Um, in 2010, they had a thousand year flood in Nashville. Again, really damaging. Two billion dollars in damage. I think that was just to private property. I think there was another hundred million to public property, something like that. And ten people died. So I want to show actually kind of a, a flawed <coughs> hand formula and something to be careful about. So the 2015 uh, city council, in 2015, the Metro Council had before it a, pr a proposal for a $100 million flood protection plan. So if you just plug this in, this is, this is not right, so don't like write this down. But <laughs> you have a one in a thousand year flood times $2 billion in damages, and you get $2 million. The proposal was for $100 million. So you might look at that and say, well, no, $100 million was too much to spend. But I would say that that's wrong because, first of all, a one in a thousand year flood is not a one in a thousand year flood or more, right? So you have to look at that. Is it now a one in five hundred year flood? Second of all, a one in a thousand year flood is only only has a one in a thousand year chance in one particular year. But you're not building this infrastructure for one year. You're building it hopefully for thirty or fifty or more years. So you, so uh, Grover had mentioned the cumulative risk of things earlier, right? You really need to look at cumulative risk not risk of just one year. And then the $2 billion in damage, that might be the same. Well, first of all, you might have more because there's increased development in the future, right? Just, just based on development. But also, 
if you if Nashville has implemented a hundred million dollar flood protection plan, it's not only going to protect against thousand year floods. It's going to protect against hundred year floods and five hundred year floods. So maybe you want to add up all the damage that you are likely to see for lower level floods as well. So it's not. I'm, I'm kind of talking about this just to point out that it's really not obvious what numbers to plug in, but it might be a good starting point to try to get to the order of magnitude of money that it makes sense to spend. All right, so moving to harm. I actually think this is not different in this context than anywhere else. You're, you know, you have your house is flooded or someone's injured, that would be your harm. Um, but it's just worthwhile to point out that some states, including Rhode Island, I believe, has um, statutory dollar limitations for what plaintiffs can recover. Causation, I also think, is not really different in this context than in other negligence claims. Uh, the question would probably be, did the government's failure to take reasonable measures to protect people from the natural disaster or the flood at issue cause the damage? Um, the plaintiff, I think, needs to be able to point to something and say, if you had done X, I would not have had this, this property damage. How is climate change relevant? I would say it's not, because you don't need to point to the rainstorm and say, this wouldn't have happened without climate change. <coughs> climate change really comes into, into play in determining how foreseeable was that rainstorm. So earlier, the stuff we talked about earlier, and also determining um, whether the city has committed a breach. But I don't think it comes into play in the causation model. All right, so that was negligence. So just to sum up, sovereign immunity is an issue, but it's not insurmountable. And, um, the uh, analysis of the prongs is really similar to traditional negligence analysis. It's really kind of a kind of situation, actually. It doesn't require any really weird model theories. It's very right, like, so. so fraud. So this is more like the situation we talked about at the beginning, where you have a state official saying, you know, I don't want to hear about it, or this is not a problem, actually making these types of statements or omissions that kind of prevents people from having the information they need to act upon and, and decrease their risk. So in 2010, uh, Cyclone Cynthia caused many fatalities and over a billion dollars of damages in a small coastal town in France. Those are people in scuba gear, scuba gear actually, trying to um, recover property and help out after the fact. So it was a really intense storm. Uh, local officials, were actually were actively encouraging development in this high-risk area. It was called the Deadly Bowl in French. Um, so that just gives you an idea of how dangerous it was there. Um, they failed to do anything about it. They failed to warn people about it. They failed to have any policies that would discourage development there. It, it, in fact, it was the opposite. As I said, they were actively encouraging development. The court sentenced the mayor to four years in jail for this. I don't know if this would happen in the United States. But this, is, this was an egregious situation. The court found that the mayor totally knew about this risk and he deliberately concealed it. Right? And people died. I think it was like 50 people or something like that. It was a really severe issue. So let's think about it in the United States. Sovereign immunity. So this is a bigger issue in the fraud context than it is in the negligence context because most states do not waive immunity for fraud claims. So just one example, in California, a public entity is not liable for an injury caused by misrepresentation by an employee of the public entity, whether or not such misrepresentation be negligent or intentional. That's pretty common. There's explicit uh, retention of immunity for those situations. Even where immunity is partially waived or there's not an explicit reten retention of immunity, there are often really major hurdles. So in Minnesota, you can only bring a, a, a negligent misrepresentation claim against an official if the official is the exclusive source of that information. Because I guess the logic is you could have gotten it somewhere else. You can't really tie your lack of knowledge about that information to the misstatement by the official. So it's really hard to get so past that immunity, and I never found a case in my research that <coughs> successfully sued a local government for fraud. So this is a, this is a really huge hurdle. But let's say you could, let's just as a thought exercise, think about the elements of fraud. So, first of all, you need, as a plaintiff, to show that the defendant made a false representation. You need to show that that representation, these are actually the prongs as they are in Rhode Island, it's a little bit different in other places, but um, you need to 
show that the representation was made with the intent to cause reliance on the part of the plaintiff. You need to show that the plaintiff's reliance was reasonable and that he actually did rely on that information. And you need to show damages caused by the reasonable reliance. So the fraud, it really doesn't fit this situation that well. There's a lot of really big challenges. So number one, who is making this misrepresentation? You're not going to find Scott Walker or Rick Scott on the record saying climate change is not an issue. Everybody builds in Miami. Right? They're, not, they're not that stupid. But they are pressuring people in their governments to say or not say things. But that, that is really hard to prove. right? That's, you don't necessarily have a paper trail there. Um, there are some states that allow you to establish fraud on kind of an agent master theory. So if the governor explicitly told someone who worked for him to go out and say X, you could potentially get the governor by that. But again, I mean, I think this is a really big challenge. Um, an even bigger challenge might be proving that the misrepresentation was made knowingly. Because we're talking about things that are going to happen in the future. We have great scientific data on this, but it's still predictions in the future. So how do you prove that someone knew or really subjectively believed in these projections? You know, they're going to say, no, I saw contradictory projections. If there wasn't something specific to my region, you know, they're going to say all sorts of things. So a question might become, you know, was there enough uncertainty in the projections in the range and stuff like that to give these people uh, some plausible cover? So assuming you can't prove they actually knew it subjectively, knew that what they were saying was false, could you try to get them on willful blindness? So willful blindness, this doctrine says that a defendant cannot escape liability by deliberately shielding himself <coughs> from clear evidence of critical facts that are strongly suggested by the circumstances. So that's from a 2011 Supreme Court case. To show deliberate, I'm oh, sorry, to show willful blindness, the plaintiff needs to show that the defendant Number one, subjectively believed there was a high probability that the fact existed. So that's kind of weird. You don't have to show that they subjectively believed in the fact. You have to show they subjectively <coughs> believed there's a high probability of the fact. So I don't know how that plays out. Maybe that's like people who look at a study that says 95% certainty, and they're like, well, there's the 5%, you know, and that's what I believe. I don't know. Um, but the second part, the requirement that they take deliberate action to avoid learning of that fact. I think Rick Scott saying don't talk about climate change, that seems like a perfect example of that. That is, you know, hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil, I don't want to know, even if it is happening. Uh, with respect to the rest of the elements, intent, I mean, there's political motivations for these things that could be great. In, uh, in France, this mayor was trying to get residential development, probably for economic reasons, right? In North Carolina, the sponsor of the bill that I mentioned from 2012, her biggest campaign contributors are development interests. Is that enough to prove intent? I don't know, but it could be, depending on what kind of smoking gun email you find. Um, reliance, I think that's plausible. A plaintiff might be able to say it was reasonable to rely on the government because governments have a lot of information that individuals don't, especially with respect to infrastructure. Um, <clears throat> And damages, again, that's nothing out of the ordinary. That's just showing my house was flooded. All right, so to recap, sovereign immunity is a really big issue with fraud. And then the elements are kind of weird in this context. I think there's a lot of challenges with proof, especially proving intent um, and knowledge that the misrepresentation was actually false. So moving on to takings, you're, you're going to hear more about takings later, um, but I'm going to touch upon kind of the novel use of the takings doctrine in this context that's sort of emerging. Sovereign immunity is really not a problem. Most states do not have immunity for takings claims in their own courts. So that's one really big strength of this type of claim for plaintiffs. The federal takings clause says that private property shall not be taken for private, sorry, that private property shall not be taken for public use without just compensation. Rhode Island has a almost exactly identical takings clause as do many other states. Um, even without this, the 14th Amendment makes the federal takings clause effective on the states. Um, some states are even more protective. So in Arizona, property can't be taken or damaged without just compensation. And 
and that, that comes up in a few states as well. So here's an example um, that was in federal court in the aftermath of uh, Hurricane Katrina. So the Army Corps of Engineers, starting in the 1950s, built a canal from New Orleans out to the Gulf called Mr. Go, the Mississippi River Gulf Outlet. And it was intended to build a sh uh, shorter shipping route between those two places. So it was designed, that, that chart on the right shows it's, how it was designed in the gray box. It was designed to be about 500, uh, 500, 500 meters wide. But over the years, erosion caused it to be about 1,500 meters wide. So it got much, much bigger. As a result of that, obviously there's way more volume of water in that canal. Also, there's more surface area of water for the wind to act on, so that fetch created bigger waves. And so this canal was really actually making flooding a lot worse than it would have been had the Army Corps never built the canal in the first place. Um, hundreds of people brought lawsuits against the federal government after Hurricane Katrina for this design flaw. Um, and many of them brought a tort claim, but that failed because the federal government was found to be immune under an exception to the federal government's <coughs> federal tort um, but other people brought a very similar claim under the takings clause, and those people have so far been successful at the trial level. So we'll talk about that case in a little more depth. So this case is called St. Bernard Parish Government versus the United States. Um, I think it was in the Federal Court of Claims. And in this case, uh, Judge Susan Braden found that the Army Corps of Engineers negligent, negligent design and maintenance of Mr. Go made the flooding in Hurricane Katrina worse. Um, so that's essentially saying they were negligent, right? Um, but she concluded that from this negligence, the federal government had taken these people's property. So this is a weird use of the takings clause. Normally with takings, you have eminent domain, you have you know things that are really clear where the government is taking their property. The government didn't cause Hurricane this is a very indirect roundabout way to take someone's property. And so you could argue that this case is a really broad expansion of liability, potentially, to situations where government inaction is the cause of the <coughs> um, Of course, you still have this link to a government controlled and designed infrastructure, which is the canal. I would say, you know, it probably, it, it, you definitely could argue that it um, broadens liability, but there's still going to be this fact specific analysis. So just to go, through really quickly. Um, you still need to show a protectable property interest. So once again, it's just showing you own your property that was damaged. Number two, and this one's kind of interesting. The plaintiffs need to show reasonable investment-backed expectations. So Judge Braden in this case said, these people had had flooding before, but they had never <coughs> had flooding like what happened in Hurricane Katrina, and therefore they should not be expected to have expected that. Um, that, I think, is a little weird because that's like kind of saying the government should have expected it, but the people shouldn't have. And maybe that's you know, based on what information they had available, but that could differ from, from place to place, certainly. Foreseeability, so the judge found that the erosion of Mr. Go made it foreseeable that the flooding in New Orleans would be worse. Um, same thing with causation. She found that the Army Corps' inaction and, and negligence essentially caused the erosion and the erosion caused the flooding. Um, substantiality, so that comes into play because this is a temporary takings case. So the judge found that these people had lost access to their property for a long enough period of time that it could constitute um, a taking. So you need a sufficiently severe economic impact, right? There's some amount of damage that's too little to constitute a taking. So that's pretty much it. I'm just gonna recap that when it comes to sovereign immunity, it's a big issue with fraud, with the access court, with negligence and taking, because I think that's something that plaintiffs will be able to get past. Um, there's good precedent in the takings arena. There's, there's the St. Bernard Parish case. There's also a case out of Florida, which I cited in the paper. If anybody wants the citation, I can give that to them. Um, and no need for novel legal theories. So with negligence is kind of your standard negligence case, um, but with fraud and taking, there are new ways of using that doctrine that would be required for a plaintiff to win this kind of case. So that's all I have. Thank you guys very much, and I will be around for the questions.
be with you in one second. Okay, thank you. Uh, I don't have to introduce myself again because I've already been introduced. Thank you, Jenny. I'm going to take a little bit different angle on, on the, uh, I'm going to talk about um, liability of, potential liability of municipalities and governmental agencies if based on adopting regulations that include climate change and sea level rise, you then tell people, no, you cannot develop. And it, the theories are somewhat the same as, as what Jenny was talking about, but I, I think that having been in the trenches uh, a long time, um, at least in the short term, I really think this is, this is where the action will be at is, um, for instance, it's CRMC, a question came up earlier. You know, we've got regulations that talk about climate change. We have findings and we have policies. We don't have standards and prohibitions yet, but at some point we're going to do that, as Grover answered in the question. And, and, and sooner or later, I think someone will challenge that. And I'll, the reason I, I say that is, is I'll, I'll, I'll give you an, an anecdote that um, maybe we'll set that out. And it has to do with, I was at a, a meeting with our permitting staff uh, with some property owners from not too far from here who had all had multi-million dollar houses. Um, and we were having a discussion about basically clearing up their assets, the, the assets that were recorded in the land evidence records as to which buffer zones applied on which properties, onto which uh, easements and restrictions and, and, and restrictive covenants were on each, each set of properties because the way they were recorded, it was recorded generally, but it wasn't recorded individually with each lot. And as we were having this discussion, that they were, they were being cooperative, and, but I said to the, to the head of the Property Owners Association, and there were probably 10 of them, and every one of these houses was well over a million dollars. And I said to the, to the head of the association, I said, well, I would think you would want this to get straightened out because you want your title to be clear so that you can get insurance and you can get mortgages for these properties. And he, he looked at me and Grover alluded to this earlier. He said, we don't have mortgages on our property. <laughs> so my point there is you have these property owners who don't care, you know, who don't need to get insurance and who don't need to get mortgages. And what they want is they want their waterfront property, whether it's there for five years, 10 years or 30 years, and they'll pay whatever price it is to get that waterfront property. And I think it's relevant because those are the people that when you tell them that no, you can't build on that coastal feature um, because of sea level rise and, and, and climate change, they're going, to, they're going to contest your decision and they're going to take you to court. And they're going to say, no, I want to build on my property. And I think that the two theories that I'm going to talk about today, briefly I'm going to talk about just the Administrative Procedures Act stuff, but then I'm going to delve into the takings. Um, Obviously, anything that goes in front of an administrative agency in Rhode Island gets reviewed by the Superior Court under the Administrative Procedures Act. And th that review statute, which is 423515, says the court shall not substitute its judgment of the administration, administrative agency on questions of fact. However, there are six criteria which the court can overturn, reverse, or modify the decision of that agency. And the ones I want to focus on here is number five and number six which is clearly erroneous in view of the reliable, probative, and substantial evidence on the whole record, or arbitrary and capricious. In order to, with that, to withstand review under that standard, you've got to have your decision based upon substantial evidence in the record. And I think that you're going to get some of these property owners that are going to challenge your regulations, saying they're not based on, on appropriate evidence. You, we haven't heard any of the climate change deniers here today, but there are going to be those that want to build in their property and I think are going to contest the science of it. So what is substantial evidence? Substantial evidence is defined as evidence that a reasonable mind might accept as adequate to support a conclusion and means an amount more than a scintilla, but, but uh, excuse me, less than, more than a scintilla, but less than a preponderance. That is the legal standard. And, and the reason that I say this, and, and to lawyers actually it makes a lot of sense, but to non-lawyers it probably doesn't. So, I mean, scintilla has a, a meaning, preponderance have a, has a meaning, beyond a reasonable doubt has a meaning, um, clear and convincing has a meaning, that's things that lawyers like. I raise these for two points, and I, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on the APA, but the first is, if you're going to adopt, and you're being encouraged here to adopt and think about regulations and ordinances, um, 
that take into effect climate change and, and take into effect sea level rise and, and that are going to take some properties out of play for building, you need to document within those regulations the science you're relying on so that it will meet the standard uh, of substantial evidence. Because what will happen, and, and we see it at CRMC on our existing regulations, is people that have these properties and that have the means to hire experts, and you can find experts to come in and contest anything um, for the right price, I would think, and they're gonna come in and contest the science. And if you don't have in your regulations, it documented why you adopted these regulations and what the science is behind it, I think you risk losing. Now, you're not gonna have to pay, but you're gonna have to grant the permit. So that's reason number one. Reason number two for this is when you get into those hearings, you need, you need to build a record. You need to put, if they bring in experts, you need to bring in your experts or your staff and to contest those um, arguments and to, to build a record so that when the court reviews the record, because it's limited to the record, that there is enough there to support your decision, and, and in this case I'm assuming it's a decision for denial, um, but you need to build that record. I think it's really, really important because this is what's gonna happen in the trenches. And, and I think it's really relevant to municipalities because you know at CRMC and, and in DEM, we're bigger agencies, we've got bigger budgets, we've got bigger staffs, I think that um, and I see it all the time, is that litigants go in against municipalities and, and municipalities don't want to fight. They don't want to put the resources up there. They don't want to litigate the case all the way to the Supreme Court. And, and that's how, it's sort of a war of attrition, how you can lose. But I think if you, if you, if you take the, the stuff you get from, from, you know, from C Grant, from URI, from us, from all these other people, and from NOAA, and all these other agencies, and you can somehow incorporate that and reference in that into your regulations and your decision making, I think you'll be on a much firmer footing. <coughs> so that's sort of the trench warfare. Next, I want to talk about takings. And obviously, if you deny a permit and someone's not going to be able to build on their property, they have to bring a separate action, not within the administrative appeal, but in a separate action um, for a takings. Now, the, the takings clause, as Jenny mentioned, has its uh, origins in the Fifth Amendment to the United States Constitution, which is, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. That is the so-called takings clause. As you heard, it's applicable to the states with the 14th Amendment, and in Rhode Island, Article 1, Section 16 of our state constitution codifies that takings claim. So you can bring, uh, the, the, the federal clause is self-executing, so if your state doesn't have a takings clause provision, you nevertheless can bring it under the, under the United States Constitution, and then you get into a fight whether you're in state court or federal court, and whether federal courts are taken, or whether you know, your state court recognizes the concept of inverse condemnation. The nuances about takings cases, there's a lot of procedural hurdles to get you to trial on the merits, and a lot of these cases get bumped out on procedural reasons. I'm not gonna get into those today, but the vast majority of taking courses, taking cases never get a decision on the merits. It's ripeness, uh, exhaustion of administrative remedies, wrong court, right court. So there's a lot of that that goes on in takings cases. So what kind of type, what types of takings are there? Well, first you have the direct condemnation, which is the eminent domain case, where the Department of Transportation says, we're building a road, we're taking your property, files a deed, and says this is what we think fair market value is, you can contest that, and all you contest in that case is a fair market value. The second case is, type of cases are what's called the inverse condemnation cases, and this is what comes out of the case law. The first type of inverse condemnation is a physical takings, and what that is, is essentially is when the government decides to build a dam, and as a result of building the dam, a big lake forms, your property is flooded, you can't use that property anymore, you can bring an, a, a takings claim for that physical appropriation. Then you have what's called regulatory takings. And regulatory takings have their origin in an often quoted case and maxim from Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes who said, the general rule at least is that while property may be regulated to a certain extent, if regulation goes too far, it will be recognized as a takings. A very, very clear bright line standard to judge taking cases on. But this is what started it all. And this is back in 1922, and in almost every takings case from the U.S. Supreme Court, it starts with this proposition. Now within, so a body of law has developed about regulatory takings, and there's two types of regulatory takings. 
The first is categorical takings. This came out of the Lucas versus South Carolina case um, in 1992, and basically a regulation that declares off limits all economically productive or beneficial uses of land that goes beyond what the background, background principles of nuisance law would dictate requires just compensation. And Lucas basically just a brief, what happened was he bought a piece of property in South Carolina waterfront. When he bought it, it was buildable. He could build two big lots. I think each was va valued about $900,000. Subsequent to him buying the property, the South Carolina legislature adopted um, a statutory, uh, a statute which basically set forth a uh, erosion line that you had to, that acted as a buffer and a setback, and that included all of his property. So by act of the legislature, his property went from being valued at a million dollars to basically zero because he was prohibited from building anything on that property. That case went to the, to the U.S. Supreme Court in 1992, um, and the court said that yes, that is a total takings, categorical takings, and 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 basically it was rend rendered valueless and therefore the government must compensate. It's not illegal for the government to take property. What's illegal is for the government not to pay you for the taking of your property. So in the Lucas case, it got remanded back to South Carolina and it was pay him or let him build. And, that's, and then, they went, you know, then it went through a whole remand process. Next are the more complicated cases. And these are regulations with, a with an overly severe impact. And the, the, the general test for this comes out of Penn Central Transportation Company versus New York City. And it basically says when the regulations places limits that fall short of eliminating all economically viable use, then the court gets into a balancing and ad hoc balancing of these complex factors of which are number one, the regulations economic effect on the landowner, two, and I think the big one that we're gonna have to deal with and that Jenny talked about is the extent to which the regulation interferes with reasonable investment back expectations and three, the character of the government action. Um, these cases are, are, this is where you get into the nuances. They're really, the court says it's an ad hoc factual <coughs> inquiry, and you have to look at each of the factors. And for example, when it says, you know, the ec regulations economic effect on the landowner. Well, in Lucas, the court said he was de deprived 100% of the value of his land. But they all, but, but in that decision, the court fought over, well, okay, is 90% all economically viable use, denial of all economic use of the land? Is it 80%? And they said, we don't have to answer that question today. Clearly in Lucas, it was 100%. What the court said is, you can't leave somebody with mere crumbs. So if, so you have to go through this fact finding. And so you look at the effect on the landowner. Okay, what's the value? Did you lose 90%, 80%, 70%, 60%? Obviously, the lesser the percent, the lesser, you, the, the lesser of a chance you have to succeed on the economic effect. The second prong, which is the extent to which the regulation interferes with distinct investment back expectations, that's really the big thing, I think, with the climate change, is because you look at, well, what were your expectations? That's when you're looking at what the science was. Did you expect to be able to have something here for 20 years? And, and you know, in the Palo Zolo case, we were able to use this prong very successfully because we basically showed that, that the project that this guy wanted to do would cost $100,000 more to do than he could make, than to even make a profit. And so we were successful at this prong. But it's, it's very fact specific, it requires experts um, and a very lengthy trial. The third part, the character of the government action, this kind of gets into the public good versus the public harm argument and that, uh, I don't want to oversimplify it, but that when you do things for the public good, that's probably a takings. When you do things to present a public harm, like a nuisance, that's probably not a takings. And in all takings cases, you always have the defense of a nuisance, that if under the state's principles of, of, of nuisance, uh, you, that activity would never be prohib would always have been prohibited, then you couldn't have had an investment back expectation to do it, but also you'd be causing a public harm, and therefore that overcomes the takings. So as I say, these are very fact-intensive cases. This is a very simplistic overview of, of takings, but these are the things that you have to deal with when you get into the takings context, and particularly when you deny permits, I think that it's gonna be a very fertile area 
um, for litigation down the road that people need to be aware of. And um, when that happens, you can call Mike Rubin and myself because we'll be the ones doing these. So that's uh, taking in a nutshell. It's, it's complex, it's, but it's, I just think you need to be aware that it can be used against you. Jenny's saying that it could be, I think it could be used to, to say you, you should not have allowed people to build. But on the other hand, from a guy in the trenches in, in this, in 2015, I think the more likely scenario is it's going to be used to say you should have let me build. So that's takings. Uh, next, we're going to move on to the panel. Uh, we're going to have John Ryan Henry. I'm going to read his resume. John Ryan Henry is a third year law student and candidate for the Roger Williams University and URI joint JD master's degree in marine affairs, focusing on coastal zone management and a changing climate. As a Sea Grant legal researcher, he supports the development of the beach stamp through analysis of state and municipal legal authority and liability for climate change adaption. He earned his BS with honors in geological sciences from Brown University in 2013. And John, welcome. It was nice to have a law student come up and present to us. Do you know how to get to your presentation? I think. Okay. We'll see. Thank you, Mr. Goldman, for the introduction, and thank you to the organizers for letting me talk today. Um, I, my name is John Ryan Henry. Um, following up on what we've been hearing this afternoon, I'm going to share some of the results of my research as a Sea Grant legal researcher. I'm working for the Beach SAMP um, to apply a lot of the legal concepts we're hearing about today to the particular case of Rhode Island cities and towns using Rhode Island common law and statutes. And in particular, I'm looking at how does the existence of improving knowledge about climate change, sea level rise, and storm hazards that the state is giving out in the form of info products published through storm tools, how does that change the landscape of legal liability that towns might be <coughs> exposed to? And what are the steps that towns can take to proactively limit exposure to that liability? Today, I'm going to focus in particular on a concept we're calling wrongful permitting. You just heard about the liability exposure when you say, no, you cannot develop. I'm looking at the liability exposure when you say, yes, you can develop. When a project applies for building permit or zoning variance or some sort of permitting, and is given approval and goes ahead with the product and subsequently suffers damage because of a storm event and whether or not a property owner can come back to the town and say, say my property was exposed to some known level of storm hazards and you shouldn't have let me build there. So I looked at the potential of this liability as a potential tort claim, a claim in negligence, um, where that would take the typical form where the plaintiff has to prove duty, negligence in fulfilling that duty, legal cause, and damages. Um, the duty question would as, we've, as we heard earlier from Ms. Klein, would really turn on the question of how the public duty doctrine applies to permitting in these cases. And to establish duty, a plaintiff would have to prove they come in under one of two exceptions, either the special duty exception or the egregious conduct e exception. And I think Ms. Klein really identified that egregious conduct is the key exception that plaintiffs might seek to come in underneath. The public duty doctrine is a strong defense against these sorts of claims. For a plaintiff that can overcome the, and, and I'll go into it into more detail. For plaintiffs that can establish a duty, uh, the question of negligence for issuing a permit 
for a project in an area of some known level of storm hazard would be um, a very fact-specific inquiry, a straightforward question of what is the uh, standard of care in construction in this kind of project with these sorts of features on this land would be very fact-specific. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, legal cause and just to talk about how the foreseeability of a particular storm event causing particular damage is regarded when you're looking at government action that took place before the storm ever happened, how foreseeable actually was that storm. And then damages would be a straightforward question about property damages. It's important to note there that under the State Storm Claims Act, damages for a claim for a permit would enjoy that $100,000 damages cap. So the research started, of course, at the State Torms Claims Act, the State Tort Claims Act, which waives sovereign immunity for tort claims, but caps damages for non-proprietary, strictly governmental functions, like permitting, at $100,000. It's important to note that even with that $100,000 cap, a plaintiff that wants to bring a negligent claim for a government action has to get past the public duty doctrine, which is a strong defense for non-proprietary functions. And they have to do that by arguing that th they come under either the special duty exception, which really turns on the relationship between that permit applicant to the town at the time of the permit application, or their case comes under the egregious conduct exception, which really turns on the precise knowledge that the town had at the time of the permit about the conditions on that property. And it's important to note that the public duty doctrine is a very strong defense against claims like this. Uh, Quality Court Condominium Association is the seminal case in Rhode Island for how public duty doctrine applies to building permits. And the language there states that a municipality should not be the general insurer of every construction project within its limits. So. What we're not contemplating is a flood of litigation coming from any damaged structure. We're instead looking at plaintiffs that can argue under these particular exceptions. So looking at the first exception, the special duty exception requires that the plaintiff argue that they, special, they specifically came into the knowledge of the town so that that particular injury to that particular and identified plaintiff should have been foreseen and known to the town. How does that apply in a case of wrongful permitting? The question would be, did the permitting process involve continued contact with the permit applicant during the application process above and beyond what's typical for that kind of permit? Um, in quality court condominiums, the Supreme Court identified an instance where a building inspector had conduct, had contact with an applicant that was sufficient to establish a special duty. In that case, that was a case in Pawtucket where the building inspector went to a condominium, identified specific violations that the residents complained about, looked at the violations, set forth a plan on how the condominium could fix those, made repeat visits to see if those corrections were made, and then eventually issued a permit even though the violations never got recovered. So that was a really fairly extreme case of a building inspector being closely involved with a particular identified plaintiff with particular problems and nevertheless issuing a permit anyway. Cases that have come through the court where the relationship is something short of that, where the town can make an argument that this was one of the permits that we issue all the time, have yet to reach this level of a relationship. So what does a defense to the special duty exception look like? It really turns on arguing the facts of the actual relationship between the state official, uh, the town official that handled the permit, and the permit applicant. Some permitting processes will require a lot of interaction. More complicated projects have more complicated permitting processes. But as long as the town can argue this was normal and reasonable for this permit, we weren't ignoring an obvious glaring problem, then you have a strong defense against this. The second 
and probably a more powerful exception that a plaintiff can <coughs> argue is the egregious conduct exception where the town has knowledge of a perilous circumstance that the town created that put an individual in danger and then didn't correct it. And the three elements to establishing the egregious conduct exception and forming a duty is that the town created a situation of extreme peril, that the town had actual or constructive knowledge of the peril, and that the town had a reasonable amount of time to correct that but didn't. What does that look like in a wrongful permitting case? Um, in building permit cases to date, the egregious conduct analysis has really turned on that second element of the actual or constructive knowledge that the town had about that property. In the case Haworth versus Lenon, which was in War Warren, um, uh, building was, this, this wasn't an area where the conditions changed. These were a pair of houses that were built on a lot that was exposed to a uh, rising water table and runoff from the roads during normal storm events. And the developer there actually gave the building, inspe building inspectors plans that were adequate and would have handled that water, but the buildings were subsequently built uh, below specs, not according to those plans, and they had basement flooding. And in that case, the court made some, the court eventually concluded that the plaintiff had not established the egregious conduct exception. The plaintiff didn't make it to establish a duty, but the court included language in denying the egregious conduct, saying that nothing in the record indicated that the town was aware that the houses were subject to flooding when it issued the certificate, or that the flooding posed a position of extreme peril. This seems to imply that there is some threshold of knowledge that a town could reach knowing about the flood risk that a, that a plot of land is exposed to, that would constitute an extreme peril that they need to deal with in their permit. Case hasn't come before the courts yet where the court has found that egregious conduct has been met, but they have language that implies there's a threshold that could be crossed. What does a defense to the egregious conduct argument look like? First, it's a matter of showing that, showing how the permit matched what the town knew about the risk at a time. A permit that addresses flood risks, uh, that addresses what sort of zone, what sort of risk zone the property is in, is easier to defend than a permit that doesn't mention relevant risks at all. Um, a permit that conforms to a hazard mitigation plan or to a plan that deals with storm risks in the town makes reference to an existing plan and conforms to it is defensible on those grounds. And also um, showing that the plaintiff had an understanding of the hazard, either because before the permitting process the town engaged in public education or contacted that plaintiff individually, or during the permitting process, it came up in the process and the hazard was discussed. The more you can show either, it, the more you can show that either it, that it was dealt with, with the information that was available at the time, the more defense there is. Also on an academic note that we noticed when we were examining this, the cases that have looked at this so far have really turned on that second element. But there's also a question about the first element, where the town has to have created the situation of extreme peril. And a plaintiff here has to argue that the issuance of the permit, rather than building on that land, was the action that created that hazard. And it's possible that there is an argument to be made that it's not the town that created that hazard. Especially when the hazard is attenuated, it's a storm event. It's not you allowed construction with shoddy materials or something, but an attenuated risk. So there's an academic question there, but so far it's turned on constructive knowledge. I talked about proving negligence, it's very fact specific, but there's one note I wanted to make about legal cause, which is the foreseeability of an individual storm event that caused damage after the town's action in issuing the permit. And the fact I just want to mention, um, we already heard about the farmer's insurance case in Chicago. 
It used to be a world in the common law where acts of God were considered unforeseeable, and the fact that they are random was a good defense against <coughs> foreseeability. That has become less and less the case in the common law today, and foreseeability of a storm event really increases the more we know about the frequency and severity of storms in a particular area. Um, just as an example of this principle, I'm pointing to a Wyoming case from 1988, Pickle versus Board of County Commissioners of County of Platte. Uh, that was a case where a uh, planning board reviewing a subdivision for septic systems uh, approved a septic system that subsequently flooded during normal nuisance flooding. And that was a case that was analyzed under a sovereign immunity, an analysis that wouldn't apply in Rhode Island, but the court articulated there a principle that the reasonable care that a municipality has to act in, in a negligence claim, include, extends to gathering information during the permitting process, and that information gathering extends to analyzing the flood risk on a particular area. <coughs> so to summarize what we've looked at, the main defense that a town has to a wrongful permitting case is the public duty doctrine where a plaintiff has to argue it comes in under either the special duty or egregious conduct exception. The negligence is a fact specific uh, examination. Uh, legal cause, the more we know about storm risk, the more any individual storm becomes foreseeable. And the damages there, damages should be capped at, under the State Tort Claims Act. Now, what can towns do before they're hauled into court to proactively minimize their exposure to this liability? Any action that improves the way your town deals with the risks to the particular properties inside it reduces your liability exposure. The more you use the information that's available, the better. That includes um, making sure your permit and your variance granting systems rigorously uses the, sci the best scientific information that's available to it. Permits that explicitly discuss flood risks, that specifically identify the science they're relying on, or the planning document that they're relying on, are more defensible. Something um, and if you look at the disclaimer language you include in your permits, if it specifically mentions storm and flooding damage, a plaintiff's going to have a much harder time indicating you let me build when I didn't realize I was exposed. Policy decisions in the town ensuring that comprehensive plans address climate change, adding an explicit step in your permitting review process, a checkbox on that application form, have we looked at the flood exposure? And then also, we've heard before, uh, Mrs. Crean talked about incentives you can give to make your housing stock less exposed to these damages, things like defining the zoning height limit from base flood, so that you, aren't pun you don't have to seek a variance to get free board. Public education, teaching the public about storm tools and about other sources of information, and also potentially specific notice to property owners. If you are looking at the information available and you're identifying enclaves in your towns that are exposed to risks, reaching out to those, homeowner, those property owners proactively can also avoid this. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. It's well done. Um, we're going to have one more speaker here, and then we're going to come up and do a panel so you can have all your pen up questions answered. Uh, next is Andrew Tights. Andy is a partner in the law firm of Vasillo, Tights & Rich. He's been recognized by his peers as one of the best lawyers in America in land use and zoning law by Woodward White. Uh, Mr. Tights received his JD from Columbia Law School in New York, where he was a Harlan Fist Stone Scholar. He's a he is certified as a professional planner by the American Institute of Certified Planners and, is a, and as a certified low impact development master designer by the RICRMC. I didn't know we did that, group. Uh, Mr. Tice was instrumental in drafting new um, state enabling legislation on zoning and land development and has drafted dozens of municipal land use ordinances. He's also appointed as a special master 
by, has been appointed a special master by the Rhode Island Supreme Superior Court. His firm currently represents four towns in Rhode Island as solicitors, Bristol, Barrington, West Greenwich, and South Kingston. Uh, he rep also represents a wide range of private clients. He practices for town councils, zoning and planning boards, historic commissions, coastal zone agencies, and the like throughout southern New England. He litigates cases in all Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and federal courts, and is also admitted to practice before the Supreme Court of the United States. Andy? Thank you, Brian. Um, yes, uh, in connection with the Metro Bay SAM plan, you require people who are applications in that area, the Upper Bay metropolitan area, to have that certification when that was first put in. And I decided it would be helpful for business if I got that certification myself. So, um, I don't want to mess this up too much here. Um, my my topic, my ending of this is kind of um, how I often feel being a solicitor representing municipalities that um, we're stuck in the middle with you. We've got everybody on both sides. And in fact, really my, my title of my section is um, damned if you do, damned if you don't. Um, do we, we have our choice. Do we get sued now um, for a takings if we re, uh, deny these permits that people are asking for? Um, and rezone their property as coastal hazard zones that don't allow development? Um, or do we get sued later for takings if we don't act after these properties are destroyed? Um, and I would add, there is a, an element that I'm going to come back to which I think affects it, which we've been talking a lot about properties, but I think there is a public health safety issue as far as the people. Mentioning, you know, floods with 10 people dying with the river flood. Um, the hundreds of people who died in 1938, uh, dozens in 1954, um, and maybe that's, maybe that's a way around it that changes it instead of it's not just a property equation. Um, it's interesting in Rhode Island, um, the state is doing a lot. Um, the Rhode Island general laws provide a lot of the protection and the immunities, and I'm going to talk about the comprehensive planning process. Um, and then CRMC has done so much here with providing these tools. Um, but although CRMC has some permitting authority, particularly within 200 feet of the coastal feature, um, the vast majority, I think, of the responsibility is going to fall on the municipalities, um, both as where we have concurrent jurisdiction within that 200-foot area, um, and all the properties that happen to be 200 feet back from the coastal feature now, but of course the coastal feature is going to be 500 feet inland in 50 years from now. Um, so I think it's good. We, we should be looking at it. It's coming, it's coming this way. I may not be around to deal with it, but if we, if we start now, it's the old thing about moving the asteroid. If you start far away, it's a lot easier to start moving it. Uh, just give it a little shove a long distance away. <coughs> Um, and also, too, the, the cost of it. If we start now um, controlling the rebuilding and, and further managing the development along the coast, um, it will cost less than it will in 50 years. Um, I look at this as, um, from what I've heard today, a lot of things, um, both good news and bad news. So let me give you the good news as I see it first if you're municipal official. Um, I think, first of all, we're not going to get sued in Rhode Island for not planning for it. If nothing else, we're going to introduce all the materials from today and talk about it. The very fact that we're here is part of it. And for all the solicitors, for, for the towns that you're here, we're, we're all protected. The ones that didn't show up, the heck with them. But, <laughs> but we're protected to start with. Um, in fact, it's even codified um, Rhode Island General Law 4522-6B10, which is the required elements from a comprehensive plan. And I just want to read this verbatim. One of the required elements is natural hazards. The plan must include an identification of areas that could be, of, could be excuse me, the plan must include an identification of areas that could be vulnerable to the effects of sea level rise, 
flooding, storm damage, drought, or other natural hazards. Goals, policies, and implementation techniques must be identified that would help to avoid or minimize the effects that natural hazards pose to lives, infrastructure, and property. So I don't know how more opposite we can get from Florida than that. We've got it codified in our statutes, requiring all 39 of our cities and towns to have an element in their comp plan that deals with sea level rise. Um, and to my knowledge, at least, most of the towns have been dealing with it. Um, those are elements um, that as they have been going before the Division of Planning and comp plans have been updated on their five and 10 year updates, that's one of the things they're looking for. So the towns are doing it, everybody is, in, is updating their, uh, those elements of their comp plan. So I think those will be very strong defenses um, going forward, the fact that we have at least been planning for it. Um, because if we plan for it and we're wrong, it's still a little tragic, but it's not a liability. Um, if we don't plan for it, that's where the liability comes from. Um, the other thing is I think we are actually taking certain positive steps um, to do it um, through things such as the grant program, through which is allowing people to get grants to raise up their properties, create more sustainable properties. I know um, Barrington, I was just hearing last night, there's about $650,000 that's being used to help um, protect several properties um, and reduce future damage. And in the end, it sounds like a lot of money we're spending now, but in the end, again, it will say, as long as we are going to continue insuring these as a government program, then it's better to spend the money now so we save it a long time in insurance. Maybe the answer is we should stop insuring them completely, but that's a separate political question that doesn't seem to be on the table at the moment. So if we are insuring them, what can we do to at least insure them as cheaply as possible for the public when there is that future damage? What can we do now to make things better? Um, kind of like some of the, um, the marine insurance company that provide boat insurance policies. Since this is Rhode Island and the ocean state, it's probably a lot, of, a, lot of us, a lot of us out there who have boats. And a lot of these companies now, if there's a hurricane warning, they'll pay to haul your boat first. They won't wait for the damage. They know it's cheaper to pay for the hauling of a lot of boats um, and risk that they are wasting the money than if the hurricane hits and they have the actual damage later. So that's the sort of thing that I think that we as a state and communities are, are doing now and again will help minimize the liability. The very ability to point to what we're doing in that aspect should minimize other cases. Um, then um, one idea that I've had just from over the last 24 hours and reinforced by today um, occurs to me that we could be doing, and I, I'm going to suggest to my communities, is that we start requiring people to sign an explicit written waiver as they're coming forward with these permits to build, rebuild, and so forth in the coastal areas, um, telling, you know, I acknowledge this uh, potential liability and uh, I'm going to indemnify the town for any damage um, to the town's infrastructure, and then we're going to record it in the land evidence records. Um, now, maybe it's not going to be that hard and harsh when it gets through the town council, but that's certainly what I'd like to see something, some sort of at least a written acknowledgement that I've been advised of these risks and I'm going forward with it. Um, we do it in some circumstances already. Bristol's a good thing when people get permission, get a waiver so they don't have to hook up to public water and they have a well. We make them sign one of these waiver letters that said, yeah, I know I'm getting a well and, you know, if my well goes dry 20 years from now, I promise not to come to the town and ask you to help me out. Um, so those are the good things. Um, bad news. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot more on the page on the bad news side than the good news. Um, we have a very strong concept in our zoning law in general, and I think in Rhode Island in particular, on what we vernacularly call grandfathered rights, the rights of non-conforming properties to continue. And we've got 350 years of coastal development already there. Um, so how are we going to deal with um, prohibiting people from rebuilding where they've already been there um, for so long. 
how are we going to prevent people from new buildings on legal lots, these pre-existing legal non-conforming lots of record, um, which under our current jurisprudence, um, it's difficult if we say no, we really are opening ourselves up to um, takings claim. Um, now I think we have some defenses to that, which I'll talk to in a bit, um, tracking the discussions that we've already heard today. Um, one interesting thing as far as, it's not gonna help us today, but if we're dealing with an issue 50 years from now, um, I like the idea, I don't remember who said it, but let's, let's, put, let's put terms on these permits. Let's not grant a sense, I mean, you're not granting a sense permanently anyway for docks, right? So why should you necessarily be giving an assent for a house forever? Um, maybe that should be 50 years or maybe a 99 year assent um, for a building. And maybe we should be doing the same thing with variances. Maybe we should be making it a special use permit and you know, what's a reasonable expectation? Um, in the way that zoning, not so much in Rhode Island, but in other places, zoning has adapted with non-conforming signs and billboards. The idea of the usable life and tailing them out over the usable life. And maybe that's a sort of thing that we could start there with that thing, so that non-conforming does not mean forever, um, but it has a time limit. Um, another problem is um, how are we going to deal with the, uh, what I will call the McMansioning of the summer cottage communities, um, both the real um, former tent colonies along the south coast, Mary Carpenter's Beach and those places, um, or just places like um, uh, West Barrington, where there are houses, but a lot of very small houses on very small lots, and they're all low houses. Um, and how are we going to, you know, a, a limit that, as was discussed, well, okay, let people go up higher. But when people go up higher, that really does change the whole character of the neighborhood. And it's also a dominating, domino effect. The people on the shore have the problem, worst problem with the flooding. They've got to go up first to get out of the flood zone. Then the people behind them have to go up to preserve their view. Or else they're faced with this big wall of high rises in front of them. Um, so that's a problem which I don't see an easy answer to. Um, there was a discussion just last night. Um, the Barrington Town Council and Planning Board were meeting, reviewing comprehensive plan and action items, and you know, there's a strong sentiment. Let's let's lower the height. Let's lower the height that we have. 35 feet's too tall. Tall. We got to go to 30 feet. Um, and then someone said, Yeah, except for those with the flood zone. And it's like, Well, but that's where our problem is. Um, and clearly it's, uh, it's a town-wide issue that's not town-wide, but people think it's town-wide, so um, that's in the bad news category because I don't see an easy solution to it at this point. Um, another issue is the problem we have with our historic areas, our historic properties. Um, those that are specific historic districts, those that are not. Um, right here in Bristol, um, Fame Street, um, you know, we have a lot of businesses and properties right along, you know, barely a few feet above sea level. Um, you know, what do you do to your walkable historic character if suddenly everybody's got to walk up 11 feet just to get to the shop that's um, on the street? What does that do to your street frontage, your welcoming street frontage when they're looking at all, nothing but car garages at ground level and everything's above it? Um, Newport. You know, what does that do to Thames Street? Um, you know, how are you gonna deal with that? And um, I guess my only solution to it is, I think this is a good example of one size doesn't fit all. Um, I think, I, think I, I said it jokingly, but I, I think it's true that you know, we're gonna have to learn more from the Dutch about building walls. And those are the kind of places that you know, Newport, where it's already mostly a seawall all along the shoreline anyway, maybe that's what we've got to do. We've got to elevate the seawall um, as opposed to, because even if we could economically elevate all the buildings along it, we wouldn't want to because that would change the whole character of the property. Um, the same thing with Bristol. I don't know about that. Maybe that's the answer that, you know, part of downtown Bristol. Maybe it's, we need to be elevating 
all those seawalls. Um, so that's another bad news problem, although probably less problematic than the, the McMansioning. Um, the other problem, um, and hopefully we're helping to solve it with sessions like today, except we're all the believers that are here. <laughs> um, but it's how to deal with the, the public and um, what I will call the misuse of the public. Um, and this comes from a, a personal experience representing one of my towns, South Kingstown, um, down in the Matunic area. Um, and the case has been litigated, so I think I can talk about it now. And I can talk about it anyway, since I'm a party. I'm, bi I'm biased, so you might as well know that right up front. Um, the council members probably should not talk about it since it could get remanded to them. You never know someday. Um, but what we've got is a situation down there. We've got a community. We've got these various communities with these campground type communities like Carpenter's Beach, these little cottages. They don't have bathrooms. They have communable community bathrooms, but everybody's got their own little cottage there along the shore. Um, and then we also do have a lot of homes there in this particular area um, of the road. Um, this is the only road access to approximately 300 homes and a few businesses um, across this stretch of road, a couple hundred foot stretch of road. Um, it also contains within it an eight inch water main, um, which serves a total of 1,765 homes. Um, and the town in looking at it, and part of its hazard mitigation looking at it, saw this as a significant problem we realize there's nothing we can do to protect that road during a hurricane event. That road's going to get covered. The waves are going over it. It's too high. There's no way we can build a huge, uh, anything big enough to withstand that. And it wouldn't make sense because everything around it would just still be destroyed. But the concern was we want to be able to protect the infrastructure we're going to issue evacuation notices. If people don't leave with the hurricane, then they're on their own. We're not going to be able to get the ambulance to them. But what about after the storm? We'd like to be able to get the bulldozers in there and clear the rubble and the sand off the road and still be able to have the ability then to get four-wheel drive vehicles in to get people. People can get to their homes in the future. Um, they're not going to be denied access to their home for a year while a whole new road is built in. Likewise, the water. If the water pipe is destroyed, if the whole roadbed washes away and the water pipe is gone, then altogether we get about 2,000 homes, which I think we're going to be revoking their certificates of occupancy and saying they're not occupiable. Um, so there was a plan to put in a steel sheet pile wall behind, and I'm saying behind, I mean landward, of an existing concrete block wall that was crumbling. Um, and there was a business owner right next to the property who didn't have clean hands, uh, who'd done a lot of illegal work, illegal work fortifying their own property. Um, but they still fought us. And, and I don't have a problem with that, okay? This is the American system, lawyer. They st saw that this wall that the town might put in, whether they were wrong or not, and I believe even scientifically they were wrong, it wasn't really going to damage their property, but they believed it would. So they had a right, they're fighting, they're arguing against the town's plan to do this. But what troubles me for our hope here in the future is the use by social media of the business owner to raise up a huge crowd of people with their customers, come defend us, we're going to be put out of business, um, and raise the coalition including the surfing groups and Save the Bay. Proponents of the retreat doctrine came in on their side. So suddenly the town, which I thought we were the good guys trying to protect public health, safety, and property, um, are the bad guys. Um, and I see that as a problem. I think it's an education thing that people have to see that um, and see what the issues are. But, but that's the other bad news that I see, that, that everybody will be continually manipulating it. And I certainly see um, a lot of very rich people as they get denied permits for their multi-million dollar, 6,000 square foot homes on their million dollar lots are going to turn to conservative legal foundations for, you know, to try to make case law and takings and so forth like that, as well as just the whole propaganda issue 
of, you know, let me do what I want with my property. Like you said, someone that, they don't have mortgages. They're not gonna have flood insurance. Why shouldn't they be allowed to take the risk? And I guess that would segue into one of my statements here that I, I think may be, an, uh, may be one of our trump cards on the liability issue if we're denying the permits, the protection from the liability if we're denying the permits now, comes to that fact that we're really not just talking about property, um, but we're talking public health and safety with the life aspects. That we can say not just we're denying your permit because we don't want to pay the insurance costs or we don't want to have the damage to your property, but because we are protecting even if you take the risk, we're protecting the future people who live there. You know, your minor children who you don't have the right to say are going to take that risk with their lives and future owners of property there. Um, and in some circumstances, we also have the issue of debris that, you know, as your house is shattered into a thousand pieces, it's going to destroy the people um, who are downwind of you. Um, that, I think, might help to protect us. Um, because if you look at the, the issues that we're talking about with Lucas and the background principles of nuisance law, um, I think it might be possible to, uh, to mix my metaphors, it might be possible to draw a nexus between that concept of the nuisance law and protecting the life and property that would um, presumably give us something um, to get out of the liability issues there. Um, on the taking. Um, how much is it? Um, the other point I would just come back to again about um, the question about the egregious conduct issue and creating the extreme peril is again I think um, I think John summed it up well. I think we need to get all that information out there. I think it's great that we have the information in here um, and make sure, as I came back to talking about that idea of you know, the waiver of liability form, it should probably have the website for the tools right on the, right on the waiver says, I've been informed of this waiver of this website and that I can find out what the you know, effect would be on my property um, and I accept that risk. So that's... We'll have to post it on the CRMC website. <laughs> <laughs> now we're going to have a panel, so if I can ask Andy to come and John to come up. And Jenny will be back in a second, and this is going to be moderated by Dennis Esposito. I've been relishing reading his bio. Uh, Dennis is a, an experienced environmental law practitioner, legal educator, and lecturer in ocean and coastal law, land use development, hazardous waste issues, and environmental litigation. He's represented clients in both the public and private sectors, including serving as legal counsel to, for the Narragansett Bay Water Quality District Commission and Rhode Island CRMC, and this is what I wanted to add, is that was way before me, and I've been there a long time. Dennis. He was chair of the environmental practice. <laughs> I couldn't. Of course, Grover said he was been here 31 years. I drafted this contract. How do I feel? How do I feel? It was great to work with him. But he was the chair of the environmental practice group at the Providence-based law firm Adler, Pollock & Sheehan for over 20 years. He most recently served as interim director of the Marine Affairs Institute and Sea Grant Legal Program at Roger Williams University School of Law and is currently Director of Environmental and Land Use Clinical Externship Program. He's been an adjunct faculty member at the law school since 1996. Dennis, and I will go to the day. Thank you, sir. Well, now we come to the, the, the fun part and really the reason why we're here, and that is because of each and every one of you. Uh, we want your feedback. We want to present or uh, make available uh, our afternoon speakers and our morning speakers, and most of them are still here. Uh, we're going to do a bit of a Q&A right now. Uh, then we're going to um, spend a few minutes on break and have some more food, as Julia likes to keep on pushing, us, pushing on us. Um, and then finally, um, I'll get up and speak again just about some, uh, what we're seeing is some leading edge topics 
Jenny hit on them earlier. Um, there's another one out there that uh, I know Grover is very fond of called uh, what I'm calling the uh, Vulcan High Tide Line. Um, we'll find out what that is in a minute. Uh, but before we do that, um, we want to start off with questions. And I think the first question I have um, using as Julia mentioned earlier, uh, moderator's prerogative, uh, picks up where Andy left off. And that is, damned if you are, damned if you're not. If the municipalities out there and the state decides to deny, we know the consequences. If you decide to grant and get sued, you know the consequences. But a very interesting topic and a very interesting point that I don't want to lose at all is the issue of promulgating affirmative regulations in these high flood danger zones as identified by the environmental coastal risk hazard system that's being developed now. So we know where there's a high flood danger zone. It's not the entire coastline. It's certain specific areas in your town. But when they're identified, the municipal towns, cities, state government are going to have to act somehow. If those regulations can be grounded in public health and safety, as Andy counseled in his remarks, we may have a hell of a leg up in being able to defend those regulations. And I noticed, uh, I stole Jenny's, one of Jenny's uh, slides, I wasn't able to put it up because I don't have that technology, but um, the Rhode Island Constitution supports that kind of regulatory approach. In fact, it says in Article 16 that talks about land use management and also talks about takings and identifies privileges to the shore that pretty much those types of regulatory actions are a valid exercise of police power and so liberally construed n not to be, let's try that, so it'll be liberally construed and not to be, uh, be a public use of private property. So there basically is a constitutional support right there to couch some of these regulations in public health and safety. Now, I'm going to pose a question to the lawyers out there. Would you write something like this? Could you see this viable as, as something when your town through use of storm tools and other scientific information that's coming out as we heard today, when your city and town uh, wants to write affirmative regulations on no build or perhaps no rebuild after a storm with constitutional support, can you see yourself doing that? Show of hands, how many people would, would like to see that happen? And I think you have a, a, viability, a viable solution there. A lot of you folks didn't raise your hands, why is that? Somebody, you're all lawyers, stand up and defend yourself. Why, why does... Too broad right now, you just said, too broad? Yeah. Okay, you have a very specific... A lot more. <laughs> you've got a very specific document that's been developed by URI. We heard our speakers today basically say that if we're going to be developing regulations, make sure that they're grounded in science that's supportable to allow you to, to get, get away from the APA type claim that Brian talked about. So you have a, a document there. It's been developed by URI. Let's say you have a substantial amount of uh, public um, stakeholder meetings. So there's plenty of knowledge out there. You have all your cities and towns there uh, at these meetings. You have all your constituents there at these meetings. You specifically invite the landowners that are part of that identified zone. 115 houses in my hypothetical. You then go out to rulemaking with public notice and stakeholders meetings that say, in the event of a hurricane and the land and the property is destroyed by my more than 45%, 50%, whatever rule you want to use, you cannot, you cannot rebuild. And the reason why you cannot rebuild is because of the threat to public health and safety. Is that too broad? What do you think, Don? Oh, I think uh, the high flood danger zone has been tried in South Kingston and overturned in the Angelica. That goes way back, and there's a lot more information out there. But South Kingstown now has a process where, okay, you can build a house, go get a special use permit. Now you come before the zoning board, and I'll just take my zoning board on Block Island, and an expert comes out. They come out with all their experts. Bill Landry and all his crew come down. <laughs> put all this stuff on the record in front of your little zoning board, who, who may have all these reports referenced. 
not one expert can show up. They, you, you're going to have trouble admitting these reports against a lawyer who's going to challenge those reports with no one to introduce them, no one to testify to them. And now you're going to find yourself in, a, in an administrative appeal, a review of the record, and we're relying on documents that most of the zoning board people haven't even read. <coughs> I'll get to you in one quick second. Uh, Brian, I wonder if you could take that question because it plays into your APA uh, defense of having supporting evidence. And I'm wondering if storm tools, if properly adopted as part of a beach SAMP and basically allowed the cities and towns and directing the cities and towns to use SAM, can be that supporting evidence. Well, I think the first thing I want to respond to is, is I'm certain that the members will have read that because you will have polled the members on the reading of that before <laughs> they, vote, <coughs> they voted. Uh, I, and I think that's, that's important to do. And I, 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 look, I think he's right, because, and that's the reason I raised the issue, is, he, is you're going to get, he said Bill Landry and his crew, and Bill's a very good lawyer, but I mean, it, it, that's the kind of guy that comes in with these, brings people from out of town that, that don't really practice here, and you know, in Rhode Island, the saying is anyone who's more than 100 miles away is an expert. And they'll come in and they will go after these studies and, and, and go after the regulations, and I think it's a serious problem. I really do. And, and I think that's why I highlighted the point of, you know, CRMC and the DEM and the statewide agencies, we have staff. We have a staff to rebut that. And, and we fight with that problem. And, and we do it. And, when, and one of the reasons we have our rules are that you have to give a seven days advance notice of who's going to come in and testify and what the area of testimony is so that we can prepare and have response to that. And I, I really think you know, um, and, and I've used in, in, in some other issues, I've, I've said to the, to the state Supreme Court on occasion that, you know, you apply standards to state agencies and you apply the same ones to municipalities and they can't, they don't have the, the, the ability to do that. And then you go down to a planning commission and they definitely don't have it. So I, I think it's a serious issue. It's an unlevel playing field for the municipalities, but you've just got to, you know, do the best you can, I think. But it's a, yeah, but it's a Don, and then I'll, I'll get to Chris and, and to folks here. I think it sort of plays off what Andy had been saying before. When you start talking about the loss of life, um, I know the town of Sidgwick went all the way up to the Mass Supreme Court on a case where they were banning development in velocity zones or V zones. And they based that on the fact that these areas at wave action, they are very, extremely hazardous areas to get in and out of during a storm event. And they don't want to be sending first responders down there to place themselves at risk, losing their lives in these areas where it is, you know, virtual certainty they'll get taken out. They went up to the Supreme Court. They defended. They were able to withstand a takings claim on that on that defense. I'm just wondering whether something like that in Rhode Island would survive that type of. I started with, with that point, um, but but not to belabor it. I, I saw a couple of other hands. Town of Westley had some questions. Uh, right here. Um, it seems to me we have a precedence with the state wetlands act that's been around about thirty years. It wasn't that controversial. We didn't put that in there. Um, and at the local level. Yeah, please. It, it, 
I think I, 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 I agree with that. And, and the thing about the, the, the takings process is one of the things that we did in the, in, the, in the Palo Zolo case, one of the issues that we had was our state Supreme Court took the position that if you purchased a piece of property with knowledge that the regulations prohibited development on that property, then per se, that prohibited a takings claim. Now, the U.S. Supreme Court disagreed with that. They said you cannot say per se it invalidates a takings claim, but it's a factor. And that actually was the, the deciding factor in the five to five court with Justice O'Connor being the deciding vote. So I think you can do that and it's a, and it's a process. You're gonna have to weed up. I think you can have that going forward for people who acquire property with that knowledge. You're still gonna have to deal with the people who own it who have owned it in their family, and I mean, it's just going to be an attrition before you know they convey it to somebody else, and that becomes a factor. But I, I think I don't know how you have any other. You know, you got to put that stuff out there in the books, and you got to let it get challenged. But it's fact, so you have to deal with it. Chris, uh, one of the ways I think that the municipalities can prevail on that prohibition is under the background principles that I think uh, Andrew or maybe even Jennifer are all spoke about. So, in the Palo Zola case, right, the public trust doctrine occurred to your title before you bought it. It came from King George or someplace back then. Um, common law prevented you from doing your cause of the land that created a nuisance. Palo Zola, you can't build any septic systems because it's trying to putrefy the, the, the salt water pond. So, you know, as the <coughs> changes, and you construct something on your land, uh, now that the sea level is rising, uh, that construction creates nuisance, i.e., you're going to, we know that you're going to, you're going to be putting your septic system, you're going to uh, be flooded, inundated, you're going to be polluting things. Maybe we're going to have to bring in public services to rescue you. Uh, we're going to have to uh, pay for the uh, reconstruction of the infrastructure because of your building. That could constitute a nuisance, and that, again, is something that you never had a right to do, and therefore, it's not a take. Prevent you from causing a nuisance. Albeit maybe 20 years ago, 50 years ago, it was a nuisance, but now the sea level is rising and periodic flooding is occurring. No. That's the You have to have a lot. Thank you for your patience. You're very welcome. Um, I, I agree with Don Parker. Um, one of the real issues is, is getting the proper expert information on the record in support of a planning board's decision that they want to deny development. Um, that, that is an issue, because unless you have the resources to hire an expert, or, or you already have in the can information that you can just put on the record, you're, you're not gonna be able to get that expert testimony, and therefore, you don't quite meet the substantial evidence standard. However, I think the solution to this problem comes well before an applicant gets to, to, to a planning board or planning commission. It, it lies with regulations, state regulations, first of all. If you have the state regulations in place that are based on the science, which was wonderful to see today, and that is put into place, and the city and town can say, look to CRMC and say, your regulations dictated this, then therefore we are only following state regulations, <coughs> then you can write your own local regulations that say we are going to be consistent with, or in some circumstances you want to be um, more stringent than the state <coughs> where it's allowed. The second thing is zoning. We have zoning enabling that allows us to, to not only overlay districts, but rezone districts um, property in such a manner that would disallow residential development on our ocean front, okay, on our sea, on the sea coast. And if you look at 45-24-37 permitted uses, it already <coughs> says, similar to the quote, the quote that you made, that it, it, it's some precedent there for actually prohibiting residential uses for health and safety reasons. Now my idea is you do an overlay district along the entire coast, and um, you make residential uses not permitted, and there it becomes a non-conforming use. And we have many, many years of history on uh, litigation on non-conforming uses that support the fact that you cannot rebuild 
once there's a catastrophic event. Now we all, you just heard today, that was one of the best quotes today was, you know, these catastrophic events are now foreseeable. They're, therefore, they're no longer acts of God. That's one of the exceptions to, you know, to right. not being able to rebuild a non-conforming use. Was, is it, if it was destroyed by an act of God. We now know that these are foreseeable events. Therefore, we can argue that they're not an act of God. Make them all non-conforming uses. And then you have an opportunity to say, under X, Y, Z circumstances, you are not allowed to rebuild both under local zoning and under CMC. I'm going to ask that perhaps Brian and Andy respond to that because I see two distinct questions. Maybe if I get Mike Rubin to, to I know he had his hand up, so I'll call on you as well because you're, you're always dragged into these things anyway, right? Just feel, feel free. One is, can a intensive uh, state regulatory scheme, regulatory scheme, not statutory scheme, as proposed uh, by, this, by, by the question, um, allow sufficient shelter, if you will, for a city and town to say, we're basing our decision on the whole host of regulations up there. I think that that's one issue. And the second issue I have is, Andy, is what you got to, or what, what the speaker, uh, the questioner just said, and that is um, the implementation of the health and safety police power of the cities and towns uh, to support, again, what, I, what we started with, to support these regulations. So, uh, Mike or Andy or, or anybody? Well, um, I'll take the first one, because I, I think the answer is no. I don't think a purely regulatory scheme would be enough to base it on. Um, I do think there's a relatively easy uh, answer in the sense that it's rocket science, but not easy in the sense that it may not be palatable. But I mean, what would be good is if going forward, CRMC included in their budget, staff people <laughs> to provide the assistance. I mean, there used to be a time when there was a division of municipal affairs, and they used to send people out before town, before a lot of towns had planners. They used to send people out to regularly attend the zoning and planning board meetings and provide that staff assistance. Um, and so if, you know, if, if as in your future hiring, you made it clear in your job description that the duties included night work to assist the cities and towns to testify to support this stuff, that to me I think would be the easy way that that, that would allow the towns to have, or somewhere, maybe through the University of Rhode Island, I don't know. But that if you had a pool of experts and people who knew this was part of their job duty, that we had our own pool of experts to call on to counter the developer's experts, I think that's that would go a long way to helping that. And other than Block Island, it's a small state. So we can pretty much cover it if we, we can pretty much cover it with the pool of anybody getting to a, anywhere. Um, and maybe you could provide housing out there. We could get someone to locate a resident yeah. Block Island expert. Oh well that housing might be in a risky area. Can I ask um, yes, please. I, as to whether or not you can just say no because CRMC would say no, I think that's dangerous territory because there have been zoning appeals that where the zoning boards have said, we're not gonna permit this because it's not permittable under the CRMC regulations, and the court has said that that's beyond <coughs> statutory authority. So you, you, have to, you would have to couch it in terms of, of you know, one of the, the, the conditions to overturn a decision under the, under the Administrative Procedures Act is beyond your statutory authority. So if you, if you do it for reasons that we would do it, you know, our buffer zones, our setbacks, our impact to the coastal zone, I think you'd have to be really careful how you did that. You can't just say CRMC regulations don't allow it. I think you're going to lose on that. I, I was kind of oversimplifying yeah, the sure. example, but there is well, a number of opportunities, uh, times where the town regulations have mirrored CRMC regulations and then it's within their jurisdiction. Okay, just one quick observation. Uh, maybe a uh, enhanced regulatory scheme may not quite cut it. I tend to agree with Andy on that. But again, not to be politically naive, because you can't be in Rhode Island, but perhaps there may be some room uh, at the legislative level to introduce some legislation that would give the appropriate shield that the towns need, that this is why we're adopting these regulations and they're based upon the science that the legislature through perhaps the, um, what's your committee, Chris? The, 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 uh, 
climate change committee. Oh, EC4? EC4, the CC4, right? EC4. Uh, maybe some recommendations out of that group. Dennis, yes. You also got to remember all these changes are going to go to the town council. Sure. Which is never going to happen. We all know that. Well, that's, that's, we, that's what we asked Jenny. Nobody representing the people in the town are going to say, oh, sorry, you can't build your house anymore. We can come up with things, but town council not well, that's what you are I struggling with, and that's what we're struggling with here. Is in, and I think uh, Teresa and or Pam mentioned it this morning, is education is the whole essence of being, and that is educating town council members. This dialogue has to be started. We cannot go forward like Governor, was it Scott in <laughs> Florida, Scott Walker, Scott Walker. Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, Scott Walker in Wisconsin. I mean, head in the sand is, is cut. Greg. Um, just two quick things. Um, one is um, uh, Rhode Island has just adopted new freshwater wetland uh, statutory scheme that has taken away the review, the local review process, you know, out of the hands of municipalities, and, and now has DEM undertake that wetlands review. That potentially could be uh, undertaken on a, on a coastal review as well, where you have the resources. Uh, in this new statute, the new Freshwater Wetlands Act, actually DEM has an expanded jurisdictional areas. Uh, the trade-off is that cities and towns cannot have their own freshwater wetland ordinances anymore. Um, and then secondly, um, just from my own experience, I can tell you in Rhode Island, there is a, a long and a strong um, uh, history of uh, allowing uh, lots that have been uh, zoned as residential lots to be built as single family residences. I know DEM uh, pushes very hard for that. Technology, unfortunately, continues to keep pace or tries to keep pace. You know, and CRMC is, is guilty of the same thing. Uh, and there are how many of uh, since uh, the CRMC uh, issue for um, uh, septic system repairs where they're now holding tanks where they never would have allowed them before. So it is a very difficult, you are, you are fighting a, a very difficult battle uh, when you're trying in Rhode Island to say that, that uh, lots that were previously zoned as residential lots cannot be built. Yes. I just had a, a question about, I, I like the idea about not being able to rebuild if there's a catastrophic event, and unfortunately I think that might be what it's going to take in some of these places. If you've got a really you know, densely developed downtown, it's not a matter of saying, you know, we're not going to let new development, it's, it's a lot of rebuilding and adding on and things. But I guess my question was, how is that going to affect somebody getting a mortgage if you were to put a, a stipulation that they can't rebuild? Is that going to... Um, maybe that's a topic for another session, but I mean, I see it. I see another level of any, any panelists up there want to. Sure. I mean, if you put a requirement that can't be rebuilt, you're not going to get a mortgage. Right. <laughs> um, with the one exception, I don't know, you might, 99 years has a kind of magical connotation in common law that it equals fee and something. So perhaps a 99 year limit might, might provide some protection. I mean, our permits right. are 50 years, and they have to get renewed. So. Yeah, not for upland structures. Hmm? Not for upland structures. And then, just to follow up on that, how would that then relate to tolling? It seems like all permits have been tolled for the past however many years. Long years. Eight years. Yeah. Some very thorny problems. Yes, sir. Last question. Then, what I think I'd like to do, keep your question, I'm going to get, I'm going to get you right now. Um, what makes sense is we're, we're generating a, a lot of thought and a lot of really good questions. Uh, I'd like to, after this last question, take about a five minute, 10 minute break, no more than that regroup and continue. Just continue what we're doing right now. I'm the next speaker. I think I, I can probably, with Julia's permission and everybody else's permission, shut up and let's continue with our, with our questions and answers. Spend some time out there over a cup of coffee, get, get, charged, get uh, really charged up a little bit with some caffeine and come on back up. Yes, sir, last question and then we'll reconvene in about 10 minutes. I'm from Charleston, so I want to say ditto on political capital expenditure. We have elected planning board and town council. That's a tall order to right. ask them to do these types of things when they're going to fix a re-election and possibly rescinding all these things. <coughs> but the question I have is that if there's some infrastructure that needs to be done and it's going to cost a lot of money and you put it out for a bond and you put it out for a referendum and it gets defeated, 
is that any inoculation against not doing what you're supposed to do? Jenny, maybe? Uh, yeah, I would, I would definitely argue that that's a great defense, right? If you tried to do something and you couldn't do it, right? Then I think the burden is on the plaintiff to point to something else that you should have done, right? Especially if it's a referendum, because then it's really not within the I, I kind of disagree with that. I think, you know, if the liability is there, it's to the corporate liability. And if the taxpayers took the risk in denying the, the, the referendum when they voted it down, the taxpayers should bear the consequences of paying for the liability later. But then how do you argue that the city was unreasonable in not doing that if they tried to do it and it was voted down? <coughs> because I, I apply the actions of the voters to, okay. to, to the municipality, to the corporate thing. I mean, we don't have a lot of, but suppose it's at a financial town meeting. Is that any different than a referendum if the, the voters at a financial town meeting voted down? Well, let's hold that thought, and please come back with questions. That's what we're going to do, I think, for the next few minutes.